Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Good evening and welcome to the Iowa City Public Library. And thank you to the Iowa City Public Library and Jason Paulus and, uh, for helping us set up this event here tonight. Uh, I'm Kathleen Johnson. I'm the events coordinator with Prairie Lights. And tonight I am very pleased to present Janet Fitch, who will read from and talk about her new book, The Revolution of Marina M. It was just released yesterday. So this is her first inaugural reading. So I'm very, very pleased to see all of you here. Um, and we're just in time for the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. So I don't know how all y'all plan to, to celebrate that after you leave here, but make it festive. Uh, yesterday's glowing review from the LA Review of Books begins at 280,000 words, The Revolution of Marina M. Janet Fitch's new virtually monumental work of historical fiction is long enough to find a place in the Russian canon. The novel is both story and history which prove inseparable as the young life of our heroine, Marina Makarova, is upended first by the Russian Revolution and later by the Civil War. But despite the book's size and the headiness of the material it tackles, Marina's unlikely buildings Roman, her growths, her loves, her dreadful losses and disappointments, but above all, her enduring hope and determination to survive against all odds, proves so gripping that it's hard to put the book down. Janet Fitch may be best known for her two previous novels, White Oleander and Paint It Black, which have both been made into feature films. But Janet Fitch has also been fascinated by Russian history for much of her adult life. And it really shows, as you'll hear her read from and talk about the book. Um, she's also worked. Uh, in in her life with her arms and legs as a as a as a real a real working person um, and she's been a proofreader typesetter graphic artist newspaper editor magazine editor waitress and she did a lot of freelance writing from everything from a local newspaper to something about kung fu um, she has been a teacher of creative, creative writing for numerous places, including the University of Southern California master's program, as well as several residencies. She lives in Los Angeles, but we're very happy to welcome her back to Iowa City, um, where she read from both of her previous books. Please welcome Janet Fitch. I love this mic, man. You can stand back, and it's very cool. Well, thank you for coming out. Um, it's a pleasure to be in Iowa. Um, my first book, uh, White Oleander, was dedicated to my father, who was from Council Bluffs, Iowa. So if you ever see that book, you'll see the man from Council Bluffs. And somebody actually made him a t-shirt saying the man from Council Bluffs. Um, so yeah, I, people know me most, mostly as a writer, uh, an LA writer. You know, both of my books were, were set in Los Angeles, but I've been a Russia, I've been a, one of those people, you know, possess, the possessed, obsessed with Russian literature. I've been one of the possessed for uh, most of my life. I um, started with Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, which is the gateway drug to Russian literature, so be careful. Um, and my father, my Iowan father, gave it to me uh, when I was a kid. I, they gave girls horrible books in junior high, books like some of you were my age, Cress Delahanty, Cherry Ames, Student Nurse. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you know, where do I, where do I toss the rope? Um, and my father said, oh, you might like this. And I still remember it was a little green book with a black square and the little guy with the torch. It was a modern library edition of Crime and Punishment. It's like, yes. 
kill, murder the landlord lady, you know, in the first 50 pages because of philosophy, and then torture yourself through the rest of it. It's just like right up my alley. <laughs> Um, and my idea of what a novel should be came from Russian literature. Um, I took Russian in high school, I took Russian in college, I was a history major, so it was only a matter of time before a Russian novel would emerge. Uh, nobody who knows me was surprised at all. Um, so I thought I would read a little bit, and uh, then I am open, then we'll talk. Okay, so the revolution of Marina M it was very cool. They let me have like lots of input on the cover. So a lot of the makeup came off, the shoulder pads on the uh, jacket. Um, so the book starts in California in 1932. Uh, I um, wanted to introduce the voice of the book before I took you back. Um, so I thought I would read. I'll start with the beginning, because I don't have to explain anything. Yay. OK. <clears throat> New Year's 1932, Carmel by the, t by the Sea. Rocking on the razor-muscled bay, lulled by the sleepy toll of buoy bells, the music of rigging, the eloquent stanzas of the waves, I wait for news from the sea. No boys and girls play on the deserted beach now. Only a few stoic fishermen huddle on upturned buckets. The slow labor of the poet building himself a stone house at the cove's south end makes for mild entertainment. If I knew him better, I'd tell him the danger of trusting to solid things. It's an illusion. All one needs is a rented cabin, a decent stove, a small boat, and a garden gone to seed for the winter. I watch the lanky form of my landlord's son crossing the shingle, coat collar up, stopping by to collect rents. I have the money in a cigar box back in my cabin, most of it anyway. It's only $5. The shack's not built for winter. I don't complain, there are shutters to block out a storm, and an iron stove with a solid pipe. In a few minutes, I will beach my boat on the pebbly shore and give him his due. We'll share a bottle of home brew, or perhaps he comes with a flask. No liquor on the pre premises just now, though it will come soon down from San Francisco. Those who love poetry, even my unreadable foreign brand, are a tender breed. Why don't you write in English, Marina? Asked my friend Elizabeth. You speak it so well. My dilemma. My English is good enough for the little stories I pu publish in pulp magazines, but for poetry, one needs one nati one's native tongue. The voice of the soul is not so easily translated, though to say soul here is already wrong. We say dusha, meaning not just the spiritual entity, but also the person himself. A tug on the line, I pull in a shining perch, shockingly alive. I add it to the rockfish in my pail and row back to shore. I have a motor, but s spare the gas when I can. At times like this, I surprise myself how I've managed to create something of a life in this foggy shore out of the broken pieces of myself scavenged from the sea like flotsam, or is it jetsam? It irks me not to know the difference. I'll have to consult my oracle, the giant moldy Websters I've acquired since my arrival here, the very addition we had in my childhood home that lived on a stout shelf along with the Nouveau Larousse Illustré, the Deutsches Wörterbuch, and Dahl's explanatory dictionary of the living great Russian language. When I was very small, I had to sit on my knees to read these books. Why do you not write in English, Marina? Because when you are flotsam, or jetsam, you cling to what is yours. After the landlord's lanky son leaves, a roll in the hay, that delightful image, I lay my Websters on the scrub table in the lantern light to learn that flotsam is the debris left over from shipwreck. Well, jetsam is merchandise thrown overboard from a ship in crisis to lighten the load. Ship in crisis. 
that it was. The difference seems to be tied to the fate of the ship. Did it survive after shedding those such as myself, tossing us overboard, jetsam, to lighten the load? Or did it founder, to be torn apart, massless and rudderless, the planks and boards washed ashore, flotsam? Perhaps one bearing the ship's name, and the name was Revolution. I could hear her a half, mile, a half mile off, Elizabeth in her clattering jalopy. I've made cornbread in my iron pot, a Dutch oven. Always the Dutch showing up in surprising places. I will have to look that up. I dredge the pink gilled perch in cornmeal and fry it with a hunk of salt pork. My mouth stirs those tasty K's, the T's, the P, hunk of salt. My friend has brought a crate of artichokes down from Salinas and Polish vodka, Smirnov. Where did she find it? The Americans prefer their native bourbons and ryes. Such a blessing after all those years of bathtub hooch. Her company is so sweet, this lovely girl with lines to grace the hood of a luxury car. Yet she treats me as if I were the exotic one, her movements careful and calm. What have I done to deserve to be treated so tenderly? Am I so dikaya, wild, that I might startle and take flight like a red deer? After dinner, she showers me with gifts, HD's red roses from bronze, for bronze, and the new Wallace Stevens, books she, a student of literature at the University at Berkeley, can ill afford. Now, she's hiding something behind her back, her hazel gold eyes bright, anticipatory. I pour more vodka into our jelly jar glasses and pretend not to notice. Finally, she holds it out, a gift wrapped in a sheet of the San Francisco paper. I flex it, thin, paper bound, and try to guess. A layer cake? Phonograph? Then tear open the wrapper. Russian, Kembuit, a book for children. Who will I become? by Vladimir Mayakovsky. My heart catches in my throat like fingers in a slammed door. Mayakovsky, dead two years now. Dead by his own hand, or maybe not. You never know, but dead just the same. Do you know it, she asks, e eager to have surprised me. I shake my head, remembering the last time I saw him in Petrograd at the House of Arts a robust and charismatic man full of swagger. Who will I become? Inside the same stepped verse he came to favor. This is the ship that sailed on without me, 1928, government press. And here are the child's choices, doctor, worker, auto mechanic, pilot, streetcar conductor, engineer, but no checkist. No aparachik, and nowhere a poet, nowhere a cloud in trousers. I get very drunk that night in the little cabin and recite aloud everything I know, penned by Vladimir Vladimirovich. I sing it as he did, that thrilling bass voice booming like the waves so Elizabeth could hear the music. When I run out of his poems, I move on to Klevnikov, Chernikov, Kuryakin. My pretty friend cannot believe how many lines I know by heart, but this is nothing. There is no end to the flow once the gate is opened. Here they teach children to think, but they don't train the memory. I suppose they cannot imagine what a person might be called upon to endure when a line of poetry can mean the difference between strength and despair. I drip candle wax into my glass, watch the drops swirl and adhere. What are you doing, she asks. It's something we used to do to tell our fortunes. I recite, I recite for her. On St. Basil's Eve, cast the wax in water. At midnight, cast the wax. Sing the songs the girls have sung since ancient times. Prepare, my dear, if you dare, my dear, to see your future. Part one, the pouring of the wax. January 1916, St. Basil's Eve, midnight, New Year's Eve, 
three young witches gathered in the city that was once St. Petersburg. Though the silver sound, Petersburg, had been erased, and how oddly the new one struck our ears, Petrograd. A sound like bronze, like horseshoes on stone, hammer on anvil, thunder in the name, Petrograd. No longer Petersburg of the bells and water, that city of mirrors, of transparent twilights, Tchaikovsky ballets, and Pushkin's genius. Its name had been changed by war. Petersburg was thought too German, though the name is Dutch. Petrograd, the sound is bronze, and this is a story of bronze. That night, the cusp of the new year, 1916, we three prepared to conjure the future in the nursery of a grand flat on Verstadskaya Street. From down the hall, the sounds of a large New Year's Eve soiree filtered in under the door. Scraps of music, women's high laughter, the scent of roasted goose and Christmas pine. Behind us, my younger brother, Sidioja, sketching in the window seat as we girls prepared the basin and the candle. I was a month shy of 16, the same age as the century, my brother one year younger, waiting for midnight. Our three heads converged over the basin of water, Varvara's cropped locks, the dusty blue-black of a crow, Mina's ash blonde as Finnish Finnish birch, woven into an old-fashioned braided crown she couldn't be persuaded to abandon, and I, with hair the red of young foxes, crossing a field of snow, waiting to see our futures, came wit indeed. A sun, a seal, a wedding ring, a house, a plow, a prison cell. It seems like a scene in a glass globe to me now. I want to turn it over and set the snow to swirling. I want to shout to my young self, stop. Don't be in such a hurry to peel back the petals of the future. It will be here soon enough, and it won't be quite the bloom you expect. Just stay there in that precious moment at the hinge of time. But I was in love with the future, in love with the idea of fate. There's nothing more romantic to the young until its edges sink their, until its dogs sink their teeth into your calf and pull you to the ground. On St. Basil's Eve, we cast the wax in water, and the country, too, had poured its wax in the year of the nine and the six. What sign did I hope to receive that night, the laurel crown, the lyre, or perhaps some evidence of a grand passion, some ardent pushkin or soulful bluk? Or maybe a boy already knew, Danya from dancing class, Steva, with whom I'd skated in the park the day before and dazzled with my spins and reckless arabesques. Or perhaps even an officer, like the ones who lingered before the gates of our school in the afternoons, courting the senior girls. I see her there staring impatiently into the candle flame, a girl both brash and shy, awkward and feigning sophistication in hopes of being thought mysterious, so that people would long to discover her secrets. I want her to stay in that moment before the world changed, before the wax was poured and the future assembled like brilliant horses loading into a starting gate. So it's a girl the, the same age as the century, and uh, she's 16 in 1916. She's 17 in 1917 when the revolution uh, comes, um, when the revolution that everyone was waiting for uh, comes. And the thing about revolution is once it starts, it doesn't stop. It doesn't slow down. It's like it brought a bourgeois government into power people who didn't expect ever to be in power. They were sort of hoping for constitutional monarchy. They were waiting for somebody's seal of, of approval. And once they were in power, they just didn't know what to do with it. And they eventually, uh, it, the, revol the momentum of revolution sped up and brought the Bolsheviks in. That government was swept away. And her father was part of that government. She favored the more radical idea. So their family was torn apart, and the country is torn apart. And she becomes an independent woman, becomes a poet, uh, joins the more radical poets, but discovers, you know, 
nobody knew what was going to happen. And it was very much like it is now, where you don't know. Every day is different. Every week something is, every week is like a day. Every month is like a year. Um, and the level of, in the fact that she's 17, she embraces that. She is flexible enough. She's, she's going to be part of it. Uh, but it was her family, the older people, you know, people became former people. You know, you're just not part of the equation anymore. Uh, so I would love to talk about anything you would like to ask. We have a mic back there. I, and I have a question. Good. I don't know if the mic is live yet. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, one thing that's so striking and vivid with the book, and I love how you introduce it, is photography. Because um, one of the character's friend's father is a photographer, and you say that the, they watch the image bloom on the page. Uh, and it's this scene of a march at the very beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what what you found by, by way of photography and kind of how photography worked for you in researching the book and kind of how you used it as a device. Oh, it's fascinating. There was a famous photographer who, who some of the photographs that you'll recognize of Akhmatova, you know, of a lot of the political figures at the time. He was um, uh, a uh, leftist and not, um, and he was, he, became very, his studio became very popular during the revolution named uh, uh, Napelbaum. And so I used him uh, as the girl with the crown, the unfashionable crown that her family, they, that, that her father is the photographer. And she's a scientist, she's a chemist. And so at some point she actually becomes a photographer. Um, because of family problems. Um, I think photography is, uh, it's like poetry in the way that it, it, it seizes a moment. And during the revolution, there are certain key moments that just, it's right there. You know, he has a photograph of a march, the women's march, which starts the February Revolution. That first revolution is started by, on International Women's Day. And it was a Women's Day march that started it. The men in the factories were going, oh, it's not ready, we're not ready, you know, and the women are going, we're ready. We're the ones standing in the bread lines. We're the ones trying to make this work. And they marched, and he takes a photograph just as the front line of that March is coming into frame. He gets that moment as the working class enters the stage, right, a march right down Nevsky Prospect, which is the main drag, it's Fifth Avenue in New York. And these women never probably walked on Nevsky before. It was, you know, a very elegant part of town. But they enter the stage and he takes that picture and they watch it bloom in the tank. Well, how did you, um how, how did you find photographs from that time period other than, you know, Google and, you know, regular news media? Did I you... love photography. I've, I've, uh, I've been a, um, I'm obsessed with everything, you know, as you probably know, most writers, we're just, all we are is like walking obsessions. And photography, especially uh, um, in the 20s, teens, 20s, early on, uh, really interests me. So I knew the processes. I, I knew what the cameras would look like. And uh, um, did you go to Russian libraries or anything like that? Or no, th there's so much on the internet. Right, when I right. started, yeah. there was nothing. Yeah. But by the time I was ready to describe these things, there was there. You know, the, it's in the inter internet, especially if you know. If you have a photographer name and right. you start looking around in the Marxist archive and whatever, it's all online. It's right. fantastic. I mean, there's never been a better time to do research. Right. Well, I've, I wondered too about the structure and I, I know there's more, <laughs> um, but, uh, but one of, since you're such a student of Russian literature, mm -hmm. one of the most amazing things that I thought about 
once I conquered war in peace. And I did skim the battle scenes, just to be <laughs> honest. A really long foxing party, it's just an allegory, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> but I was so Im impressed and floored by its structure. I wondered what kind of, how, how the structure of traditional Russian novels might have influenced the structure of this book. Well, Tolstoy was the one who said the novel is a big baggy monster. And so my <laughs> sense, I structure the novel symphonically. I, I, it's like when you're making a symphony uh, or an opera musically, you want to have some uh, major key, you want to, then you follow with minor key, you want uh, a single instrument comes in and then maybe another instrument joins it. I work musically, so not to tire the reader. Um, if I have a, an outdoor scene, I'll have an indoor scene. If I have a group scene, I'll make sure to have one scene or a mass scene or somebody out in the country, you know, and just keep keep changing it up. Um, so I, that's how I structure, it, I structure it musically. Uh, I also took a cue from, from Mr. Tolstoy, you know, probably the greatest novelist. Um, yeah, right. I mean, I'm a Dostoevsky fan, but I, I'm gonna say that I'll give it to Tolstoy. Um, uh, Hemingway said, you know, I mean, I could go, he said, I could go, 16 rounds with that guy, but you know, and I get in all these blows, but when he would land a one, I'd be out. That would be it. You know, he's the heavyweight. And to, look, what Tolstoy does with his not long novels is they always have short chapters. People would read aloud at night instead of watching TV. They'd, you know, they'd read a chapter or two. And I thought, oh, you see, when you read something like that, that's you know a long book, but you feel like you're making progress because you're, you know, the sh chapters are short and they all have names. So I, I definitely did that. I, I took a page from his book. Well, thank you for not making us wait for a hundred pages to come back to the same character. It was a lot more easy to follow. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I like history as, as we live it. You know, writers often do a braided story. They do like three voices. So they write about one person and then they, that they've said enough about that and then they can go to the other person and tell their story until this guy has done something and then they can come back to him. But I really like to soak into the, into the point of view of the single character and really be that person, uh, walk in their shoes, think their thoughts, um, it's, uh, you lose the writer relief of being able to move to other characters, but I think for the reader that absorption is really, I like it for myself, so. I don't mean to hog all Here's the one. questions. In history, there have been hundreds of revolutions. The United States Revolution, Revolution in Czechoslovakia. Some reason, some way, somehow, writers seem to really like the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. Why is that? Okay, why the Russian Revolution? Uh, why? When I started writing this book, there were very few novels written about the revolution. You know, aside from Dr. Zhivago, uh, there weren't there weren't a whole lot, um, especially written by people in the West. It, it's um, because, so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna argue with this a bit, uh, because there, the sense of who the good guys and the bad guys, it's, it's not as clear as say, you know, if you talk about the siege of Leningrad or the battle of Stalingrad, it becomes more clear. Um, I think that in desperate situations, people show their what they have in them. I, I think that um, the French Revolution took place at a time when a lot of the writers were still profoundly affected by the results. And they, in, it was in fairly recent memory that they could write about it. Um, I think the Russian Revolution maybe now, 
there's been a window in which Russians could start learning about their own history. There's been more history written about the Russian Revolution by Westerners than by Russians because their history had been so distorted, um, you know, through the Soviet times. When they opened the archives, I mean, the, the Western researchers were able to do more. And that window has opened, and I don't know what's, whether that's going to stay open or not. You know, it's a continually evolving question. Just the idea that now we're at the centennial of it. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be Did really you interesting. start writing this book and time it so that it would come out? Oh, my God. I started this about 11 years ago, and if I had known that it would take this long, I don't know if I would have done it. I had a cousin who was working on a book about our family in Russia, and she was bogged down like year 15 and saying, don't do it, don't do it. You know what happened to Napoleon, don't do it. And, you know, of course, I didn't listen to her. Um, but I did really had a lot of talk with my editor saying, it's got to come out by the October Revolution 100th anniversary or, or you know, I, I'm going to kill myself, but I'm going to get it done uh, in time. So I was aware of it by the time I was finishing it or editing it, but not uh, when I started. Uh, I thought, who the heck is going to care about this? As you write, you set deadlines, though, as you go along? No, I'm in constant state of panic at all times. Uh, I, I don't have to set deadlines. I'm, I'm always putting my face on the, on the grindstone. Um, yeah, no, it's, the sense of urgency is always there, especially when you are not a fast writer. You're always aware of the clock ticking. Here's another one. How did you come up with uh, the character? How did I come up with the character? Um, I had written a book that failed before my second novel, Painted Black. And, but there was a character I always really liked in it. And this woman was a Russian emigre uh, living in LA, working as a hotel maid. And she's a very well-educated woman. Um, and it's like, what are you doing here? Uh, she, I knew she was poet. It's just like, wow, you know, how did you get here? And the more I wrote a short story uh, about her, and then I thought I would love to expand that story and write, write a book. And, um, but as I wrote, I realized I didn't know enough about her to write her memories, to write her dreams. You have to know a character from the inside out, and I didn't know her well enough, <laughs> and before I knew it, I was writing a book about the Russian Revolution, about her in the Russian Revolution, to find out what had happened to her and why she ended. And I don't take it all the way to LA, but uh, that's, that was the impulse to the book. One of them. What else? I, I can talk to you about writing. I can talk to you about life. I can talk about Russia. You can ask me anything. Here's another one. Well, in here, but I was reading on Goodreads because I, I didn't know anything about this book. And they said you really did your research on this. And how long did that, well, 11 years yeah. ago. Yeah. But did you already know a lot about Russian literature? Right. This is, you, is the this question is about, about research. How long, why, you know, how long did it take, and, really and what did I do? Uh, I had a fairly good grounding in Russian history, um, but not the revolution, the intricacies of the revolution. I did a lot of just plain old library research. I was an uh, uh, adjunct professor at USC, so I could take out books by the semester instead of by the three weeks at a time. That was very helpful. Hundreds of books came through. and. I found the memoirs were particularly valuable, especially women's memoirs, because they paid attention to how daily life was lived. How did you do the how did you do the laundry? You know, how did you watch clothes? I mean, where did the what was the how did you cook when the, you know you had the you had to cook over what and what fuel and and uh, where did you get the fuel when it was illegal to take wood 
because people were tearing down their buildings for wood. Um, <coughs> Just the every, you know, like bits of everyday life, the women's memoirs were fantastic. So I wasn't as interested in the politics after certain, so, you know, got a solid grounding in what happened. But I wanted to know more about the details of everyday life. Um, I was a student in Leningrad in 77. Um, I was an exchange student in England, and they all sent their, their students to Russia. And I thought, well, I can be English. I went over with them, and I was a um, so I was a student in Leningrad in '77, and then I went back 30 years later to research this book. Everything had it looked like everything had changed. I mean, if I they weren't speaking Russian, I don't know if I'd even have recognized them. There was Russian Vogue. There were supermarkets. There were you know thigh high blue suede boots. You know, people were. Uh, so glamorous, just. But I will walk the streets as Marina, and it was January, whereas I'd been there in the summer. Now I was there in the winter. The Russians said, "We, you can't understand us in the summer. You have to come back uh, in the winter." So I went back in January, and uh, I was her walking the streets, touching the rails. You know, really, I work on sense impression really strongly, so it was important for me to be there. Uh, looking up at windows, and and yet I still had so many questions that I wasn't getting out of my. Re There's never enough research. Anybody who has done history will know, will recognize this. Never enough research. So you always feel that if I just could do some more, I would get more info. I I get the information, and um, I applied for a fellowship. Uh, to uh, a Russian foundation called the Likachov Foundation, which offered residencies for American cultural workers who were doing a Russia project. Had my name all over it, right? And I went, and they made appointments for me at the institutions, the Akhmatova Museum, on Akhmatova, the poet. Well, there's a museum, the Museum of Political History, the Museum of the City of St. Petersburg. I got to see things that I'd only read about. And it's important for me. The tangible reality is, is everything to a novelist. Um, so I got to see things, and I got to ask questions at the Akhmatova Museum. In America, if you go see uh, a curator at a museum, you get a, like an assistant curator, and they'll sit you down, they give you some water, they'll look at their watch, you know, you get 15 minutes, you know, ask your questions. No, not in Russia. The director invites you into her office, the candy comes out, the tea, the teacups, the colleagues all come in, like six or seven really interesting people. The door closes, and they sit back in their chairs, and they go, so tell us about your project. And I was in there for two hours. They talked about Marina as if she existed. They knew where she went to school. They knew which poet she was like. Oh, no, she was like so-and-so. No, she's like so-and-so. And they, and they told me about my character as if this is somebody we had in common. And then I knew that I was, this was going to be real. The book was real, that these people recognized her. So the research just, one thing flowed into another. Here, there's another question. Were you able to record that two-hour conversation? No, but I take pretty good notes. Okay. Yeah. I, I that came. That sounds like a lot of value to oh, I took, I came to Russia with seven pages single-spaced of questions, and all of them were answered. Yeah, so they were all the notes. Here's one. One, that is a lovely cover. That is beautiful. Um, Kathleen got her copy of this book Saturday from Prairie Lights and consumed all of her time, which really freed up my weekend. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with all that research, not enough research, but and the magnitude of this novel, did you ever just get down the rabbit hole on this and have to, did you ever get lost? Oh, in the narrative? it's. It's not so much that I got lost. It's it's you know, it, it was there were there were crises of faith. Um, I despaired of it. W I f sometimes I f I'll admit that I felt like I was building a Gothic cathedral all by myself. It's like, shouldn't there be more people doing this than just me? 
Um, but I have a quote from Dorothy Allison uh, in my office that's, fiction never exceeds the writer's courage. And I just thought, if I stay on the horse, if I just don't fall off because I'm chicken, if I just like grab the mane and you know try to just stay on it until it runs itself out, that that that's you know it was riding through the despair. You know, my cousin told me not to do it. You know, I was warned. Um, so yeah, that there there were some very dark moments uh, in there, but uh, then there were moments like the Akhmatova people from the Akhmatova Museum like talking about her as if she were real. <laughs> that just, it's like, wow, this is real. This, is, that I've, this thing I've created is actually, you can walk in and walk around, you know, it's gonna. Speaking of characters coming alive, uh, what was it like having <coughs> two of your previous books made into films? And did you hope or fear that this one will? Well, um, how did it feel to have it the two? Series, yeah, how did it feel to have uh, two films made of of my books? Uh, it's fabulous to walk into a set that you imagined in your little creaky office um, and actually physically walk into it, and it's like a dream because you know how in a dream you know you're in your parents' house, but it's not quite right. It's just like that. Uh, it is, it's fantastic. Um, the films were very different, like one was like a real big Hollywood film, you know, multi-billion, million dollar thing with those stars and stuff. And one was like one woman's vision, the Painted Black movie, uh, which is streaming, it's online at, uh, you know, various Amazon and iTunes and blah, 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 if you want to see Painted Black. That was one woman's vision. She raised the money herself. She got those actors to work for free. She just, it, it's so beautiful. It's unbelievable. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of like being the grandparent. You know, you watch your kid raise their kid, and it's like, wow, isn't that great? And then it's like, woo, and I don't have to do it. You know? <laughs> it's, it's all the fun and none of the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> and this, you know, if I, I've certainly, uh, it would be, it would be nice if they made a miniseries out of it. I think that uh, um, it's like War and Peace. I always like the the, the miniseries better than trying to make a movie out of, you know, a huge epic novel. Sometimes it works better. Although I got to say that that you know, there are certain big Hollywood films like. Uh, I remember seeing Dr. Zhivago. Oh, that made a lasting impression on me, that little train across the vast expanse of Russia. Um, that certainly stuck with me, so we'll see. The jacket says you're working on the second half. I'm working on the second half of the book. I'm gonna take her all the way through the revolution. Um, so, uh, yeah, finishing up. Is that going to take another 11 years? No, no, no. It's, it's <laughs> like it'll, you know, it'll be done. It'll be in the bookstores in, 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 I can say 1919, 2019. So again, we're staying with the 100-year <laughs> framework. But this book completes itself because it's about her coming of age, my character's coming of age. Uh, by the time uh, she's through, she is definitely, she's an independent woman. There's no one to rely on. There's no one who's going to save her. It's just she's going to be standing on her own feet and not turning to anyone for anything. Which is steamier, the first book or the second book? <coughs> um, or you don't want to say. They're, I heard it's a they're both pretty steamy, the first book. The first one is, this is one is probably steamier. There's, there's, you know, when you're finally in the third and fourth year of a revolution, there's like lots of other stuff that's going on. And she just really finds herself as a poet. Um, and so there's a lot more poetry 
in that one. And I was very lucky that uh, there's a, a guy, he's an editor and a translator who's done all original translations of the Russian poetry in the book. So that was, that, you know, that was super to see that happen. And I could consult. We could say, oh, you know, that choice of word, let's do this. That was a thrill. How long does it take from the time you finish a book until it's set on the shelves? It, uh, from the time you finish a book to the time it's on the shelf is about a year. Okay. It takes about a year. Uh, they, they can go a little faster now. Um, technology has improved, uh, but about a year. I had the same for the two books of this. Yeah, they'll be uh, my editor's Russian, uh, so we have interesting conversations about that. I've I've not named anybody after her yet. She better behave herself. <laughs> now she's wonderful. She's wonderful. Yeah. Um, here's one. learning history better through an individual's perspective. And I think a lot of students like myself sort of struggle with history, especially at a certain <coughs> age, because it's all about dates and names and that kind of stuff. And it's sort of taught in a way that isn't as personal. Right. Was that the case for you, or did you always I history? I always loved history. You know, this is the question about perceiving history through the consciousness of a single person. I, what I find when we see the tales of the people who make history, which is generally you know, what, what history is all about, um, we get a vicarious sense of control. You know, we, anybody you know, have, has listened to Hamilton, you know, they want to be in the room when it happens. But most of us are not in the room when it happens. Most of us are reading the shadows on the wall, you know. We, we, and I think that there's, it's not only, you know, there's a lot of potential for tragedy, obviously, but there's a certain nobility to rising to the occasion of living in that uncertainty and living in response to these great forces that are out of our control. Um, I think it's, it speaks to something even deeper in the human being, and that interests me. Uh, I think that not, we don't, you know, Marina doesn't know what Lenin said to Trotsky in the 10th committee of whatever, but sometimes she'll, but people were hungry for news. You know, they're always reading the wall, the wall posters and rumors like you're standing on the bread lines and everybody's got a theory very much like now. I think that this book is more applicable now than it was when I started. You know, I, I, see the, I see the ramifications of living in history in a way in my own life that were, it was just theory to me when I was writing it. And now I just see it every day. Yeah, I think it, it's a, I like, I like history told through a consciousness. Um, even though we, we don't get that vicarious thrill that we're in charge. What else? Here's another Could one. Could I have written this book 30 years ago? Could I have written this book 30 years ago? Um, no, because of the internet enabled me to get information in a way that I had no, my Russian is not good enough to go to the state archives in the Soviet Union back then and try to negotiate my way into those files. Um, I couldn't have done it. There was no internet. Um, and I didn't have the, the confidence that if you just stayed on the horse that you actually could finish something like that. Probably also a person of experience in your own history. Mm -hmm. Gives you a perspective on history. Right. <clears throat> right. There's one. What kind of routine do you stick to or abandon or something like that when you're on the horse, off the horse? It's 11 years. Yeah, what kind of routine do I use? In terms of the writing? 
yeah, in my process. Um, I write all the time. I'm not somebody who gets inspired when I'm in the shower or baking cookies or something. You know, it's like, no. I only get inspired when I'm actually working, when I'm handling the materials. Like, if I have a great idea when I'm taking a walk, it's never a great idea. I get home and I try to use it and it's just stupid. So I have to be working to get ideas um, so that there's, I don't, if I take a vacation, um, only somebody, another writer would go, you know, yeah, you, of course you take a crate of books and your novel with you. Uh, so there's no vacation, there's no, uh, I get up in the morning, I read for usually about 90 minutes because I have just piles of books everywhere and if I don't read like really seriously, I don't get, can't get through the books. Um, and then I work, um, you know, I'll work until like three or four yeah. <laughs> until I'm just, I'm just done, I'm just cooked. And then if I, if things, come together again, say after dinner, I'll go back to work. But usually by four in the afternoon, I'm, I'm pretty fried. Uh, and then I'll go do my other things. But I work out, uh, you know, to me, weekday, weekend, holidays, it, it doesn't make any difference. It's all the same. So it's kind of a, it's sort of a, <laughs> I shouldn't say it's a mole-like existence. I try to go outside. <laughs> at least a little bit. Um, but it's a dedicated life. It's like a, being a monk a little bit. You know, it's like having other, any kind of profession of faith. Anything else? Do you have to rewrite a lot? <laughs> I start, do I have to rewrite a lot? I start every day I start every day by going back and rewriting what I wrote the day before. That's how I move forward as I go back and then forward. So everything in the book has gone, been gone over countless times. And then I do drafts. I'll do usually four drafts. Um, so yeah, I go, I go over and over and over it. Um, I'm not one of those, oh God, when I started writing, I didn't know how people wrote. I wrote my little three-page bad short stories. And I thought, you know, you read something like Moby Dick is so beautiful, and how in the world did, did he do it? He just sat down, it just came right off his... It never occurred to me that people wrote drafts, that they started out with something crummy, and then they worked on it. You know, I, it never occurred to me because I, I wasn't an English major. I, 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 had learned to, I had to learn to write, you know. And on the other hand, it helps me teach because I had to learn everything. So if somebody's like the natural born genius, I mean, you can take a class with that person and admire them, but they often can't unpack how they learned things. They don't know. They just knew, well, thanks a lot. It's like my dad teaching me math, you know, the engineer. It's like, no, this comes naturally to you. Give me this, the person who had to struggle and let them teach me. Then I'll learn. Well, I just want to thank you so much for coming. Um, and everyone, Janet Fitch will be happy to talk with you and sign copies of the book. We have them um, for sale outside your more than more than welcome to do that and uh this has just been amazing this is cool. just a great book and congratulations and thank you. thank you for coming here for the first stop i hope it's a great tour i got my book signed by prairie lights the first signature <laughs> when i go and speak i people sign my book so and i'll sign yours if you'd like me to Very so, good. Thank, thank you thank you so much